Well, God's good all the time. And you just might as well believe that. Might as well let it sink in. Even if today you haven't felt like it. God's good all the time. And all things do work out for good to them. And I want you to listen to these words. Them that love the Lord. See, when you love somebody, you do for them. You don't have to be told. You don't have to be asked twice. You just do it. When you love God... Nobody has to tell you to serve Him. Nobody has to boss you into it. Nobody has to rake you over the coals over it. When you love God, you just serve Him. Amen? Amen. By the way, we, you noticed our baptistry, baptistry trans, uh, transformation is in progress. We've decided to go with a blue theme and to make it look like you're in prison. That's the stripes. And the latter, what we intend on doing is actually dipping the baptistry people down with a rope three times in the name of the Father, like a fondue, in the name of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Huh? By the feet. Well, it hurt if we put it around their neck. That would be bad. That would be a bad idea to do that. Um, so... I pre Todd's worked on that a little bit, and Brian's worked on it a little bit, and I appreciate that. And uh, I've been in contact with a family that uh, the wife does beautiful painting work. And she goes to Brother Kelly's church down in Norwood. And if you've watched any of the videos I've done at that church, the, the background of that church, have you seen it? I, when I saw it, I went, that's, that's it right there. So we talked to her about it a while back, and she back then said she would do it. And, um, and I've been in contact with the family in the last couple weeks, and I still think that's the plan, so we just got to arrange it. The husband actually teaches uh, classes on gun safety and for churches or for organizations. And so what we'll do is we'll bring them up and let him teach us about gun safety in our church. Yeah. And then she'll be painting. Well, I ought to have it where they do it simultaneously. <laughs> so that we can watch her paint and then listen to him teach us about how not to shoot your toe off. That's a good idea. So anyway, it's good to have you here tonight. Boy, I hated, I hated uh, not being able to come Sunday. Um, I had a message, and I still, I have it. It's not gone anywhere. Um, turn your Bible to Psalm 98. Turn to, turn to Romans. Let's go to Romans. We're going to start in Romans tonight, and I'll tell you where I'm going. But I'm going to tell you about a man... I'm going to give you the preliminary. His name is Steve. Steve's wife, years ago, started coming to this church. And she was backslid and she knew it. And she surrendered her life back over to the Lord. And she loved the Bible. She loved this church. And she told me her, she prayed for her husband all the time. And I said, you keep praying for him. Well, I can make it long or short, but I need to make it short. But anyway, I went to his house, witnessed to him, and he knelt and prayed. I baptized him here. And for a while, he was in God's house. But then I could see the old was clashing with the new. And I talked to him a little bit, tried to encourage him. I could smell the alcohol. 
So I knew that the old was winning. And he took his life back down farther than he had ever been before he started coming to church. See, this Bible's right. This Bible is right. In 2 Peter chapter 2 talks about this. It was worse on him going back to his sins than it ever was before. And he passed away last week of a drug overdose. That threefold cord is strong. It is not easily broken. And um, my, that broke my heart. And I learned about that last Saturday. And so I have a message that is a warning message to everybody. Paul warned us, any man thinketh he standeth, take heed, take heed, lest he fall, take heed. That, that Bible's right. You can fear God, or you can be arrogant in the face of God and demand that God put up with your sinfulness. You can live your life two ways, it's up to you. But I fear God, because I know what He can do to me, and I don't want Him to do that. So, I let one slip, and I don't like how I feel about that. So, you take that however you want and you go back to the word of God and you ask God some very serious questions about where you stand with God and you take heed lest you fall father in heaven come before you tonight and God I thank you for my salvation my salvation is the most important thing to me and the most precious thing that I have ever received in my life. And I love my wife, and I love my family, and I love my church, and I love my country. But I will not, I will not trade my soul in for anything. Because it's not worth it. And Father, I pray, God, that you would open up somebody's eyes. Somebody. Doesn't matter to me who. God, that you would wake somebody up who right now is in the throes of sin. Babylon has her grips. That strange woman has a vice grip on their life. And her steps always lead to hell. God, would you wake some soul up and straighten them, Lord, and put your fear into them. Your spirit is the fear of the Lord. So, God, would you stir up people and remind them that you will never sit in the back seat of their life. Never. You are going to be first always, or you're not going to be. So, Father, awaken us to your word tonight. I don't want to be somber tonight. Lord, I pray, God, that your blessings would be upon the teaching, upon your word. And, Lord, uplift and edify us tonight. And Father, that's what this word is for. But, God, it is also a warning you loved Israel, and you were betrothed to her. But you wrote her a bill of divorce, because you wasn't going to put up with it anymore. 
And Father, remind us of that. Remind us of that often. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us this book. And we ask, Lord, your blessings upon all those who need it tonight. Open our eyes, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's, learn, let's learn the Bible. When God uh, grabbed a hold of me back in 19... I'm going to say it was 1997. I kind of remember it was November of 1997 that God stirred my heart about studying the Bible as a prophetic word to know. And, and God had put it in my heart that I wanted to know this Bible. I wanted to know it. I didn't want to just quote a few verses here and there and then go about my life. I wanted to know this book. I had a lot of questions. I wanted to know. I wanted answers. Some of those questions, I have not had answers yet, complete answers. But God is faithful. God, is, God knows about me. God knows timing is important. And God, I understand that God sometimes has to lay a foundation of understanding and knowledge in our life in order to give us wisdom. He'll never, God will never build wisdom on a shaky foundation. He never will. God And the foundation of wisdom is always knowledge. You've got to know this Bible. Know it. Because the, I'm telling you, the internet has taken over this world and it's everybody. In Kenya, they carry smartphones around. The poorest people in the world are getting cheap Chinese smartphones. And they're attached to the internet. And it is corrupting good doctrine everywhere. I mean, and I mean everywhere. When a church that 50 years ago would preach against sodomy, fornication, couples living together. When they would preach against that and be right in doing it. Nowadays, not only condone it but actively participate in it, then there is a problem with them not knowing or disregarding what God said in His Word. It's a huge problem. This is why our pews sit empty and the other churches' pews sit full is that most people do not want to know the real God and to know about His ways. And He tells us His God does not keep secrets. He reveals things. So, I, I mean, it just hit me. Boom. Let's study doctrine. Okay? Let's know what God says about certain very fundamental things. Now, there are things that I talk about. I talk a lot. And I plan on, believe it or not, my desire is to be able to talk more than what I'm doing now. That's my plan. I don't know if God's going to let me do it. I don't know if I'm going to let me do it. But that's my plan. Because the big mouths with the fake doctrine, they don't stop. They don't shut up. And I'm very appreciative of all the people who know the Bible and are out there, even if we don't agree on this little issue over here or this little issue over here, that has nothing. I don't care. They're, they're telling people to get in God's word and read it for themselves. And I'm very appreciative of the guys who will do that on social media, because social media is basically where all the leaven is right now. If you want to get somebody good and leavened, Facebook and YouTube will do it very quickly. Amen? Who, who would have ever thought that 60% of the American people who took science courses in school question now the shape of the earth? Social media has done that. So let's, let's get this one thing right. How does God save a sinner? Why does he need to? Why does he need to? Okay, so let's get this thing right. Let's study salvation. Uh, I had you in Romans. We're going to walk to Romans Road here in a little bit. But Psalm 98 two is what I have on the screen. The Lord hath made known his salvation. His righteousness hath he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. God has de God, God declared this in the Old Testament. God declared this 3,000 years ago. That he was going to... And that's past tense. 
He's already done it. Uh, when David or whoever it was wrote this down, God said, I've already shown openly salvation. Why you need it, what it's about, how you get it, how it's kept, so on and so on. Righteousness hath he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. So we're going to study salvation. So get ready. Get your Bibles out. Did you bring a Bible? If not, reach up there in the pew and grab one. Not a hymn book. A Bible. Romans 3.23. Charge. Go there. Rome, this is what we call the Romans Road of Salvation. If somebody comes to me just out of the blue and wants to, Hey, Pastor Mike, I, don't, I think I'm going to hell. I heard you talk about hell. I think I'm going to hell. How, how can I not go to hell? Well, let me show you from the Bible. The Bible says in Romans 3, 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us. Who is that? That's all the preachers. That's all the popes. That's all the bishops. That's all the Muslims. That's all the Jews. That's all the Buddhists. That's all the atheists. That's all the, that's all the church people. That is everybody. Everybody sins. Everybody breaks God's law. Everybody does it. You're sitting in a sinner's anonymous, not so not, not so anonymous, but you're sitting in a AA meeting for sinners. We're not, we're not holy, righteous, pious, who has never done anything wrong kind of people. We're the people that have a addiction to sin. We're hooked into it. We like it. And we don't like what it does to us. We don't like what it does in our families. We don't like what it does in our relationships. We don't like what it's doing in our country. We don't like what it does to our church. We, and we know that we have the wrath of God waiting for us on the other side of this life. And we're scared because we don't want to burn in a lake of fire for all of eternity. That's Romans 3.23. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. Romans 6. Charge. Look at this. Look at verse 22. But now, see, salvation is being made free from sin. But now, when are you free from sin? Now, being made free from sin, become servants to God, you have your fruit, who are you servant to? Salvation means that you are a servant to God. And you're doing it willfully. You're glad to do it. It, you're, and by the way, you're not paying a debt because you don't owe it. God gave you His Son as a gift. Not as, not as a gift plus tax. Not as a gift plus membership dues. He gave His Son free to the whole world. Every tribe, every race, people of every religion can be saved. They just got to change the religion. Well, I'll put this. This is what God put in my mind today. Love God and trust God and let God change your life. I'm not asking you to change your life. And I'm not telling you that once you start coming to church, you must change your life. What I'm telling you is, if you will ask God, He will change your life for you. That's how He did it with us. Raise your hand. That's how He did it. He made the changes in you. You didn't do it yourself. If you take that credit, I, I, I'm not going to stand next to you in judgment, I'll tell you that. Romans 6. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, give your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. Is death. Death comes on us all. Every one of us. They're going to click our casket lid shut, put our body in the ground, but our soul is going to have to stand before God in judgment. It is appointed unto man once to die. But after this, the judgment. And it's not going to be the Republicans. It's not going to be the liberals. It's not going to be the holly weird people. And it's not going to be the church people. It's not going to be the angels. It's not going to be the devil. It's going to be Jesus Christ, the righteous son of God, who's going to judge you. God is going to judge you for what you did. So, the wages of sin is death. But, but, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If it's a gift, then it's not of... Say the word works real loud. If it's a gift, then it is not of... 
works. John chapter 3. Turn there. John chapter 3. Verse 15. Whosoever believeth in him, meaning the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave. It's his gift. It's his gift. If you love somebody, you'll go buy them flowers and candy tomorrow. It's Valentine's Day. If you love somebody, you hold them tight. You squeeze them. Kiss them on the cheek. Tell them you love them. If you love somebody, you'll do things for them. If, if you, guys, if you love your wife, you put the seat down. Amen. Ladies, if you love your husband, you won't yell at him for leaving the seat up. You just say, honey, it helps me at night. Please. Okay. But if you love somebody, you give to them. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever, what? Believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If it's a gift and He said to believe, then it's not doing good that makes you saved. It's believing and trusting in the one, the only one who was righteous, Jesus Christ. Turn to Ephesians 2, 8. Ephesians 2, 8. Charge it. Ephesians 2, 8. The Bible says, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of who? Yourselves. It is a, it is the gift. The gift of God. I never thought about that before. The consolidation of everything that God does in your life is through His Son, Jesus Christ. God has never done anything in this world without doing it through His Son, Jesus Christ. The Bible says, by Him, as the was the world created by Him, all things consist. Through Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ. God used His Son... Made his son the sacrifice, made his son the atonement, made his son the high priest, made God, everything God does is through his son, Jesus Christ. You cannot have salvation without God's son. If God will not do it without his son, you can't get it without his son. You must be, believe that Jesus Christ is the true and only son of God. For by grace are you saved through faith, it is, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, Lest any man should what? Every religion, every religion in the world boasts of what they do. They boast of their acts. They boast of their religious rituals. They boast of the size of their churches or the look and the appeal of their churches or how many people are planted in the pews or how much money they brought in or what they do. They boast. You show me a religion that puts works to get something out of God, and I'll show you boasting. They always boast about it. God said he's removed man's arrogance out of salvation. You want to be saved? Then you must come to God on your knees. On your knees. Why? On your knee. And that I'm here I'm talking about, I'm making it sound like it's a work. On your knees shows submission. Now, if you want to fall down on the floor, fall down on the floor. You want to lay across the bed, lay across the bed. If you want to pull the car over and put your head down on the steering wheel and beat the dashboard. I've done that before. Beat the dashboard and cry out to God. Then fine. But you've got to submit. It's a gift. But you've got to surrender. Your fight with God has got to stop. Somebody say Amen. Uh, now turn to Romans 10. Romans 10. Turn back to Romans. What did I say? Romans 10. What has Romans 10 got to do with it? Romans 10 shows you. I mean, it's, it's, it's easy. Romans 10, verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth. Why the mouth? Why the mouth? 
Why did God say you got to confess with your mouth? Why? Huh? I believe that. Your mouth is. Out of the mouth is the abundance of the heart. That's what it says. James, the book of James says, the worst, most evil member of your whole body is your tongue. So God says, I'm going to make you say it. You see, do, do we not do that? Do we not, Paige, do you not do that with those boys when I give them candy? What do you do? What do you do, Paige? What do you make them do? You don't make them say, now think, thank you. Think it. Say it. If you believe it, you'll say it. And you won't be ashamed of it. If they cock a pistol and put it to your head and say, deny Jesus and we'll let you live. You'll say, I'll not deny Jesus and I'll outlive you. Amen. I needed this. Romans 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead... Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Look at verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be damned? No! Shall be saved. Mouth. Mouth. You spent your whole life using your mouth for the devil. Now spend the rest of your life using your mouth for Jesus. So it's fair, amen? Turn to 1 John. 1 John. That's getting close to Revelation. 1 John. You know, if you're going to drive through the... What is it? The Mojave Desert? It's got a J in it, not an H. That's Mojave. Whatever I say. Mojave. I'm smart. I'm not that kind of hillbilly. If you're going to drive through the Mojave Desert... There's a gas station right before you get into it. Is there not? There's a gas... John. If I was going to put a gas station anywhere in this earth, I would put it at the entrance to the Mojave Desert. Because I'm going to rake it in. And I'm going to charge triple. You want my gas and you want my water and you want my soda pop? You're going to pay for it. Okay? Okay? First John is right before the end of the Bible. It's the stopping off place before God starts pouring his wrath out. And he says, this is how you're going to know you're saved. This is how you are going to know that you're not going to get it. First John, chapter 1. The Bible says, verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he, meaning Jesus, is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. So if somebody told you, we got, we got behind a person today on 270 that had a bumper sticker that said, uh, plead to America to pray the rosary. The rosary. What is that, Aaron? It's a necklace. That they say you must touch all these beads and recite these prayers that are not in the Bible in order to get Mary to save you. Uh-uh. Yeah. Because, well, it depends. See, they got a, they got a price list. Believe it or not, in old times, they had a price list. The Catholic Church printed up a price list that if you did certain sins, the mass to forgive you of those sins was going to cost you such and such money. And the severity of the sin, they upped the money. So the rich got away with a lot more than the poor people did. But here's what I'm saying to you. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Not part of it. 
and then you've got to pray out the rest or you've got to you got to beat yourself or you've got to crawl around on your knees or you've got to do this and that and the other. He said, all sin. If we say, watch verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You have unconfessed, unrepented sin and God is going to hold you guilty for it. Guilty. That man that shot and raped those women at that Catholic bookstore, he pleaded not guilty. He's guilty. Should we let him go? Because he said, I'm not guilty. Should we let him go? Should we let him out? That cop that shot that up playing a game, stupid game with that other cop, that lady cop shot her in the chest and killed her. Should we let him go? Neither should God let us go. But he said, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. from. There it is again. All unrighteousness. That, my friends, is what salvation is all about. Do you agree with that? I mean, it's, it's very plain, very simple. And they say this 400-year-old Bible, nobody can understand it anymore. I get it. It's, it's easy. It's e I understood it. When I was a kid, I understood it. That's the 70s, man. All right. So let's talk about the salvation. That's the Romans road of salvation. All right. So that's the... That's the primary lesson. That's the early bird 101 lesson on salvation. Now, let's lift the hood and look and see how the engine's put together. How does this work? I used to take tape recorders. My dad would buy me tape recorders, Todd, at yard sales because he knew when I got them, I'm going to take them apart to see how they worked and to plug it in and touch stuff on the circuit board to see what it would do. That was fun. Okay? Yes, I tripped the breakers a couple times doing that. I didn't know that AC and DC, you couldn't do that. I didn't know you couldn't do that. I found it out. But I know it. I know it now. Okay? So let's open up the hood and find out how God does it. That, that verse, the Lord hath made known his salvation. So in his word, listen to me. Everybody look up here. Don't trust a man to tell you how to be saved. Don't trust a man. God is true and every man is a liar. Now I'm not ever deliberately lie to you. Never. But I could be wrong about something I say. I could say something in the wrong spirit or I could say something and come out of my mouth wrong or whatever. And every, listen to me, how would you like to live your life? Everything you say is recorded. I make mistakes, but God never has. If you don't trust anybody, God's going to teach you how to trust what he said in this book. Okay, so Matthew chapter 1 verse 21 he, sh he shall bring for the son, this is preliminary now, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. This is what salvation is. It is being saved from your sins. It is, it is saying that you are judicially guilty before God. You don't want anybody to judge you, and that's all well and good. But God is going to judge you. And God knows, see, you can con everybody else into believing that you're good and that you haven't done anything wrong. But God is the one who wrote down every thought, every deed, everything you looked at, everything you said, everything you went to on the internet, everything you put in your mouth, everything you shoved up your nose, you st wherever. You, God wrote it all down in a book. And it doesn't go away unless the blood of Jesus Christ covers it all so that when you stand before God and they open the book of every deed that you've ever done in your life, those are covered now and cannot be charged against you because that has already been paid for you on your behalf. So let's say that my buddy Steve back here, let's say that he's racked up 30 traffic tickets. And they've pulled his license four times over it. 
You did not have to say that out loud. But since you did, I will say it I, only once, he says. See, I thought I was making this stuff up. I can't make this stuff up. You guys are guilty. So, and he owes, now he owes $5,000 in fines. Court cost, fines, penalties. And he has no job and he has no money. And the judge says, you're a repeat offender. I'm sick of seeing you in court. You say you have no money? I'm going to believe you. So I'm going to send you one year in jail. One year. You got to eat green bologna, stale bread for one year. Okay? Now with God, it's more serious because the penalty is death. But su suppose... Steve's father. Steve's father came to the courtroom, stood before the judge, and Steve's father had $5,000 in his bank, and that's it. Steve's father said, Your Honor, if it please the court, May I pay his debt? The judge says there's no law against that. If the prosecutor's okay with that, your lawyer's okay with that, I will accept that. And he clears his bank account and gives the judge everything that he's got to pay his son's debt. Now it's paid. He gets a receipt and it's written in the court records. The debt is cleared. The offenses are gone. And even though Steve did not have to pay anything and was not out any money whatsoever, the court cannot come back on him. That's called double jeopardy. And our founding fathers knew the abuses that kings had, had put upon men. And they made sure that nobody could ever be gone after more than once by the government. Government gets one shot with you. And if they loot, they lost to OJ, didn't they? Yeah. They lost to OJ. Yeah. Okay? They get one shot. Now that the debt has been paid, it's cleared. And it goes off and it's as if he has never, ever done it one time. But his father had to give everything to pay the debt. And your father sent his only begotten son. You're the adopted son. And you think your father doesn't love you as much as he loves his only son, but then he gave his only begotten son to be in your place so that he took the punishment and you walk out free. That is salvation. Jesus shall save his people from their sins. I know some of you. I know things you've done. You have no right to even be in a church. And yet, you're here. Why? God forgave all of your sins. All of them. Ephesians 2, 5. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened. Quickened means made alive. Brought back to life. We were dead in sins. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved. And grace, I've been covering this like in Sunday school. Grace, what did we say, Brother George? The unmerited, unearned favor. Unearned. All Steve did for his father was be his son. But his father loved him enough to pay his debt. 
See, grace is given to people you love. When you have people you love, you forgive them. Amen? Don't you, Melissa? When you love him, you forgive him. Amen, John? See, it works both ways, doesn't it? When you love him, you forgive him. And you do it free. That's, Christ, that's salvation. 1 Timothy 1.15 This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Paul said, now watch this. Paul said, of whom I am chief. Now, do you believe the Bible? Do you, Chris, do you believe the Bible? You ever thought to yourself the dirtiest, rotten, most individual that ever walked in shoe leather? It happens. But see, you're wrong. See, I believe the Bible. If Paul said he was the chief of sinners, that lets you and I off the hook. If God will forgive the chief of sinners of all their sins, then God will forgive you. Surely he will. It's free. Absolutely free. Costs nothing. So that's the setup for it. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get into God's consistency in salvation. And here's what I mean by that. There are those who have a viewpoint that says in the Old Testament days, God saved sinners and allowed them into heaven if they kept the laws of Moses. That's not true. It's not true. Then there, that same bunch will say that, you know, let's say some, they say like after the rapture that the Jews, God's going to restore the Jews, but he's going to save them again by law keeping. That's not true either. What I'm going to show you first is how consistent God is. If God saves one person by grace alone, through faith alone, God saves everybody by grace alone, through faith alone. Everybody the same. I'm going to show it to you. Isaiah 51.8. Now, here's what I'm hoping you'll do. I wanted to know salvation. I wanted to know it. So a few years ago, I embarked on my own study. What I didn't do was watch YouTube. What I did not do was read blogs or commentaries. What I did was search the scriptures. There are so many men who are saying so many different things about salvation. Who do I listen to? Who do I listen to? Well, if I want to be in this denomination and they believe this way, then I got to believe that way. Now, I may not believe that way, but I want to be with them. So I got to say I believe. But that's, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be in a denomination just because they're a denomination. I don't want to be in a group or a some kind of movement Simply because, well, they're the big thing going right now and I'm just going to follow them. Believe it or not, people do that. People say, well, I was born a Baptist. No, you weren't. I mean, raise up your arm. You don't have Baptist as a mole on your skin, on your arm. You were born a sinner that needed salvation. Search the scriptures for in them you think you're saved. And what that means is, you think salvation. You think Bible, you think salvation. You'll know it. You'll know what it says. And that's what I did. So what I'm hoping you'll do is make your own notes. You listen to me. I'm going to give you a ton of scripture. You write them down. And then you go and find out whether or not I told you a lie or not. Because I, I could be wrong. Let me, here's what God said. Isaiah 51, 8. For the moth shall eat them up like a garment. And the worm shall eat them like wool. But my righteousness... See, what he God is saying is, this world's going to pass away. Everybody dies. I talked to a lady today. You pray for her. She called me sobbing. She said, my husband found out he's got cancer. He's going to die. She said, I don't want my husband to die. 
And I said, ma'am, I love you, but everybody dies. And I said, out of all the enemies and all the hurts that we face in this life, death is the worst of them. I said, and the Bible said, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. I said, now your husband is fighting a battle of cancer, but I'm telling you, the last battle he's going to fight is death. And then after that, he won't fight anymore. He won't have to. So I, I mean, I did. I tried to give her comfort because she didn't want to lose her husband. Okay? So you pray for her. But everything passes away, guys. You're not everlasting. You're not immortal. You're going to die. What are you going to do? What are you going to do when you die? How are you going to get to heaven? What are you going to say? Rehearse it all you want to, but you better learn what this book says. And you better believe it. So he said, the moth shall eat them like wool, but my righteousness shall be forever and my salvation from generation to generation. You know what that means? The way I got saved was the way my mama got saved. And the way my meemaw got saved. And the way that my great grandmother, Lorinda Hoggard, who died at 101 years old, who believed the old Bible, she believed the old time way, she was a saint of God. She said, God told me I'll live to be 100 years. And he was off by one year. God, she lived to be 100, 101 years old. She died. But she knew God told her. God told her she's going to be 100. She made it. And the way God saved her is the way God saved me. And the way God saves me is the way God saves my children and my grandchildren. And all you name, you name the generation, God saves people one way. And here's what I'm saying to you. Do not think that you have worked out your own separate deal with God. Write that down. You, you, God didn't sign that. God did not tell you that. You made that up. Malachi 3, 6, for I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not considered. What is it he's saying here? I am the Lord, I change not. God does not change. Hebrews 13, turn your Bible there, Hebrews 13, watch this, here we go, Hebrews 13, 8, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, what is zero in Spanish, huh, nada, thank you, Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same when, and today, and forever, be not, watch this now. Be not carried about with diverse and strange YouTube videos. Diverse and strange doctrines. The, the internet is ruining Bible belief. It's ruining. I feel more impressed now to be on the internet to say what very few others are saying. Be not carried away with divers and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. Not with meats. Which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. And you know what meat is in the Bible? Meat is what you eat. It's anything you eat. So here's a church... Here's a church telling you, a church that has a billion members worldwide with a Pope sitting on a throne. Carried by... Do you know, you remember that in the old days they used to carry the king around on his throne, right? They'd have slaves... The Pope had a seat. It's been replaced by the Pope Mobile, but for years the Pope would sit on a throne carried about by men. Twelve men would carry... The 13th man, Brother George. 13. Read Revelation 13. Read Acts chapter 13. Read Deuteronomy 13. Mystery Babylon. That number stamped on the beast, on the Antichrist, and on Babylon. But that's what would happen. That Pope would tell everybody, you got to listen to me and do it my way. That wicked man. Okay? But the, that church will tell you. Now, see this right here? See this? See this, see this wine here? See this, see this uh, cookie that we're going to give you? If you eat this, you'll be saved temporarily. You'll have temporary salvation on you. If you eat, look at your Bible. It is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats. 
which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Eating something does not save you. Believing what God said does. Let your heart be established with grace, people. Let grace sink down into your heart and tell you every day, God says, I still love you today. What about tomorrow? We'll wait till tomorrow. And tomorrow shows up and it's now today and God says, I still love you today. I still, I still forgive you. I still care about you. My son still died for you. He only died once, but he, he did it for you. He did it for you. And it's, it's established. Let your heart be established with grace, people. God's consistent in how he saves people. Jesus Christ, same yesterday, today, forever. Ephesians 4, there is one body. Turn to Ephesians 4, one body. Ephesians 4, you're not too far from there. Page 200 and I don't know what page it is. Ephesians 4, verse 4. Listen, aren't you glad that we don't have to roll out some big long Greek scroll? Where's, where's Ephesians? Are we, are we there yet? Hey, man. God made this so simple, and yet there's so much ignorance. Ephesians 4, verse 4. There's one body. Not two, not three, not seven. There's one body, and there's one spirit. One spirit. Even as you're called in one hope of your calling. The same hope. Helen, what do you hope for when you die? What do you hope for when you die? Hey, where? That's what I wanted you to say. What do you hope for when you die? Heaven. That's the same thing I want. Who else wants to go to heaven when they die? I wouldn't mind not dying and going to heaven. In fact, I would prefer that. There's one hope of your calling. And there's one Lord. And there is one faith. One faith. And one baptism. And it ain't water. It ain't that. I'm not, I, I'm just teasing. I'm not really going to dip people by the feet in a rope with that ladder. I'm not going to do, thought about it, but not going to do it. There's one baptism, and that's when the Holy Ghost washes your soul, cleans all your icky, nasty, filthy, God-forsaken, disgusting, hell-bound sins. That's when God does that. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in y'all. God's consistency in it. I'm almost done. Titus 1. To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith. Same faith, guys. Now, I know that from time to time, I say things that you go, hmm, I know it. I'm not asking what it is. It's not important. Helen wants to go to heaven when she dies. I want Helen to go to heaven when she dies. I want to go to heaven when I die. You name me one thing that's more important than that. So I'm not about to try to start getting in arguments with everybody and debates about how I see it this way and you see it that way. I don't care. But are you saved? Are you saved? Are you go, are, do you have that common faith that I have? Beloved, Jude, verse 3, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Common salvation. One salvation. One way. And it's who? Say his name. Jesus Christ. Christ alone. Alone. So, no, I'll not be joining the pastor's gathering, the community pastor's club or whatever they call it. I'm not joining that because I don't agree with a man who says it's not Jesus alone. It's through the saints, through the church, through the priest, through the Pope, through Mary. I'm not joining up with that. I don't go along with that. And I'm going to do everything I can to wreck that. Because it's a terrible way to tell people. It's the wrong way.
It's one. There's one common salvation, people. Okay? Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So right there, Brother George, tells you, Jews get saved the same way Gentiles get saved. There is no difference. Romans 2, 9. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentiles, but glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles, for there is no respect of persons with God. No respect of persons with God. God doesn't say, now the whites, I made them better, and I prefer them, and I'm going to have them come in first, and then I'll have all the blacks and Latinos and the Asians they can, they can clean up and mop up for all the whites. God doesn't say that. God hates that. God hates it when somebody says, because of my color or because of my race or my family, I'm better than somebody else. God hates it. I hate it. I hate it. Red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. God's consistent. God doesn't respect you, whoever you think you are. God doesn't say, well, I know I provided my son for the rest of the world, but I like you, so I'm going to let you come in different than everybody else. No, sir. You're going to have to meet God at the cross, or you're not going to meet him. God has demands that he will not compromise on. And you're going to meet God at the cross, no matter what. You got that good and clear? Does God save everybody the same way? That's what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say anything different. And you're going to get people on the internet that's going to twist it. And they're going to turn it around. And they're going to have you read. Now, go to this website. Dr. So-and-so wrote a really good article. Read that article. Or we've got stacks of books. I like my stacks of books. My stacks of books tells me that God saves this person different this way and God saves this person different this way and God saves me this way and God saves go, go save somebody else another way. I don't care. You eat those stacks of books. Read this one. One God, one salvation. It's the same. It, it's free. How can it be different? 